Uh, yes, can you hear me? Well, loud and clear. Uh, excellent. Good morning, everybody. It's a little earlier for me, but I think it's still morning for you. Um, I'm Terrell Russell. I'm uh, from the IRADS Consortium. I'm in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And uh, I think we've spoken uh, at CS3 last few years. So I'm hoping that some of this is just review, but I'll go over what the, the new stuff is the last couple of years, last year. And uh, this is really a talk about how our process works and how we hear from the community in terms of what we spend our time uh, working on. So I'm hoping that that's uh, perhaps instructive and, and maybe similar. And I'd love to hear if there's um, you know feedback on some some blind spots in case there's things that, that you feel that the CS3 community is doing that uh, we should maybe be doing too. So uh, we are an organization inside of a university uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So we are uh, state employees. This is not a not a company, not a product. It's a, it's a platform. And uh, really, the, the idea is about sustainability and making the community grow and having good software uh, that you know in the open. Very similar uh, aims uh, to CS3. We've got uh, paying members uh, around the world, a few uh, anonymous ones who don't want their logo used because they feel like it's a trade secret at some level. Uh, uh, Surf is a big uh, proponent of what we're doing, Utrecht, a lot of work in the Netherlands, and then also uh, across um, uh, EU DAT, actually the data fabric for EU DAT is all built on IRODs. Uh, so a lot of uh, data protection laws in Europe obviously are stronger than in the US. So we've got uh, quite a few friends in and around where where you are and uh, so the talk here is really going to be about these four things just kind of where we came from how we work and then uh, some, some current work uh, we have been doing this for a, for a long time now uh, this is a, a code base that's been through a couple revisions and uh, the latest release uh, last couple releases actually we worked for a year or two on on locking itself so uh, the last conversation was was very interesting i think there's definitely some corner cases around um, making sure that multiple people have access to the same data at the same time. Uh, we think that uh, everyone eventually gets to the point where they need something like this. Uh, the kinds of conversations that are happening here, we think it's very important. Um, you know, as soon as you are, are big enough and you need to be able to find things and, and communicate, uh, you know, you're going to need something that has the kind of features that IRODS has that, that, that um, you know, the CS3 is trying to provide as well. And so a slightly different approach, instead of a sync and share model, we actually have a, an API level where uh, everybody has to go through the same, um, the same middleware, and, and that allows uh, some more control over um, all the different comings, go comings and goings. So it can and talk to existing infrastructure, but provide clients that speak the protocol. And uh, that allows for, for more control, which allows you to make uh, very strong claims later about what happened, uh, who's, who's been here, how many, how many files have moved, um, you know, who, who logged in, who, who deleted things, that kind of stuff. And so this is provided by uh, kind of four core competencies. One is we abstract uh, the data storage itself. So we can talk to kind of any, any flavor of storage, uh, any type of technology uh, can be anywhere. We've got a catalog that keeps track of where all the things are, obviously, and, and all the metadata that, that's about the data, uh, including user supplied metadata. So it can be arbitrary uh, annotations. And then we've got a policy layer, a workflow automation, where you know all of the operations in the entire system can be um, uh, programmed against. It's a programmatic platform. So then you can automate basically any, uh, any operation in the entire system based on any action that happens. And the fact that it's open source and uh, a, a protocol itself means that any different institution can run the same code and they can talk to each other, but they're in charge of their own uh, universe and their own authentication and their own policies and things like that. So it can scale uh, laterally as well as, um, as vertically. And so over time, we have been talking to many groups around the world for their, for their needs and, and requirements. And uh, through that policy engine, people were building things, but they were missing some corner cases. And so over time, we realized that there's really seven or eight things that everybody basically wants to do. And so we've now packaged and supported these things, uh, which and provided some knobs for configuration. So uh, organizations don't have to write their own code. They don't have to have uh, necessarily a, a full-time programmer to be able to 
interact with this layer and, and, and make it do what they want it to do. And so these are derived from the use cases that we've seen. And so uh, the claim now is that everything we've seen the last, uh, I don't know, five, seven years basically fits as a subset of this, this model. You know, most people show up for ingest or storage tiering um, across their different uh, facilities or uh, organizations. And then with the same platform, they can start to provide things like auditing and provenance and some compliance issues if they have, uh, you know, federal mandates or uh, data protection laws that they have to keep keep abreast of. And so this has been very satisfying. Uh, on the philosophy side, we've started the hundred year view. We came out of uh, originally came out of physics, uh, but then made our way over into archives and library land because people need to keep this stuff around for a long time. Uh, we do have a plug-in architecture itself, so we spend a lot of time thinking about the bookkeeping and the, the, the protocol and the API, but uh, the things that touch other people's code are plugins, so those can, can move a little bit quicker and, and be more nimble. And it's all about policy composition, so we've got different policies at the low level that can be combined and provide you know, the more complex, uh, higher level things. And we try to keep very, uh, obviously, <laughs> reduce the number of bugs. Uh, uh, at all times, uh, modern software practices and things like that. And then it's really about configuration and, and not code. And so all of our stuff is done in the open. We've got a Google group, uh, you know, all of our 100 plus repos are in GitHub. And then we've got uh, some working groups uh, that have been spun up to solve kind of the problems of the day. So we've got lots of people doing uh, metadata templates, trying to um, require certain attributes and things around their data. Uh, and they want to make sure that things are consistent across time and space. And turns out everybody has different opinions about how that works. So this is actually a pretty complex problem. Um, and then uh, we've recently uh, come to the clarity that authentication is uh, uh, something that each organization wants to do themselves, turns out, which makes sense. And so we are uh, spending a bit more time uh, making the authentication framework more flexible to allow for uh, some edge cases that, or, you know, use cases, not edge cases, use cases that people have that uh, were not kind of not part of the original protocol for IRODs. And then most recently, we've uh, partnered with the Open Microscopy Group, uh, which is its own organization and, and kind of international uh, standards working group uh, that produces Omero, which is the Open Microscopy software. And so we've got people from all over the world very interested in this. Uh, Omero is kind of a um, a tower, you know, you run it in one place and it has its control of its own storage. So providing some some lateral flexibility and, and control to a shared storage space and policy layer for Omero is a big deal. Uh, from our perspective, Omero becomes just another client, but it opens up a whole world of um, new new people and new science that we haven't necessarily been a part of recently. So this is this is exciting for us. And then I'm going to go through uh, a few uh, use cases here. We've got a few more minutes. So in the last year, we've um, released different clients and different plugins for different uh, organizations and communities. Uh, we do have integration with like a, you know, uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, also through the Python client. Uh, we've got web GUIs, uh, kind of file browser and sharing and that kind of stuff through Metalinks. Uh, IRODs can actually be presented as NFS uh, to other entities. So uh, that's uh, file system integration that allows um, also we do that through WebDAV and so people can have access to the regular tools uh, but still get all the power on the admin side for the um, for the policy layer and the and the control of where things are coming and going and that becomes a very big deal when when locking becomes uh, something that's important uh, right you've got multiple users around the world doing the same touching the same things at the same time and, and they see the same kind of conversations around uh, should I merge this am I in charge can I touch it at all and then uh, we've got a management tool that's now a web GUI built on a new REST API. Uh, we've been interacting with, uh, with Globus. Uh, so that's, that's nice and easy. And so some of the tools that we've got, those, those uh, seven or eight uh, capabilities that I was talking about, uh, one of them is used here for our um, S3 layer. So we've got lots of people using S3 as buckets. Obviously, this is, a, this is the future. Uh, and we think that anybody with the S3 API uh, can, can benefit from this. And so if there's a Lambda facility, uh, you know, I know that Azure has something similar, Google has something similar, um, Amazon's is called Lambda. And so we've got a functionality that allows people to 
uh, basically watch a bucket and it'll keep uh, IRODs up to date in real time. So we can be downstream from, you know, whatever tools are doing work out there. Uh, many people show up with existing data already. So uh, automated ingest is something where you can just scan and watch an existing file system uh, of any size or shape and, and keep the catalog up to date. And again, this can scale uh, across different organizations. So if, if IRODs is watching one file system or, or 10, depending on the size and shape of it, uh, you can scale that accordingly. Uh, we've got the ability to uh, kind of flex across different storage technologies. And so if you've got something that's fast, something that's, uh, you know, your, your long-term storage could be in the middle and you've got a, a tape archive maybe on the right. Uh, this is a hands-free way to keep things uh, kind of flowing across based on time or any other arbitrary uh, requirements that you may need to keep things, you know, hot, right? So if you've got a, if you've got a group that's, that's paying for all the storage, uh, you know, you can annotate them with with being special and then everybody else's data moves over time, but theirs doesn't or something like that. So very flexible, very powerful. And um, obviously again, storage agnostic, uh, these things can be swapped out underneath uh, at any time. Uh, the indexing capability is fairly recent. So this is again, just some metadata uh, attached to a particular collection or, or data objects. And uh, when that happens, if the, if the magic string is correct, then the, the framework can wake up and uh, uh, send that information that something's changed over to uh, whatever indexing system that you may already have. So that could be Elastic or Solar or Gina or something like that. And uh, the, the uh, API is open and, and can be changed, uh, but we've got plugins for this. So again, people don't have to write code. This is just a matter of uh, annotating something and uh, making the infrastructure that they already have a little bit more powerful and, and interesting. This is the uh, web GUI that was originally designed by EMC. Uh, merged with Dell. Uh, and so they uh, contributed it to the consortium. And this is now the, the primary um, web GUI that we uh, recommend for people that's built in house. Uh, many of our uh, customers, clients, partners uh, build their own clients because they don't necessarily want generic access to everything. They want their scientists to have a very particular view uh, based on the particular domain that they're in. Uh, and so, but this is the generic one that we provide out of the box. Uh, we have recently uh, been working with Cyverse in Arizona uh, on a Go client. So now all the features of this uh, platform are available to the Go uh, universe. And there's been a couple of cool things built on top of that already. Uh, but that's pretty exciting. We've got clients in uh, uh, Python, C++, Java, uh, now Go. And so this is uh, just to make the footprint a bit wider. This is the NFS uh, integration that I was talking about. So uh, this sits uh, between uh, a user and the IRODs interface, so they never really see uh, the, the back end, but uh, they just, you know, enter into a directory structure and uh, everything that goes in and out of that NFS uh, mount point is actually going through the IRODs protocol, which is um, pretty powerful and uh, very, very elegant for existing systems to kind of dip their toe into the policy realm a little bit. And you know, obviously, most uh, most existing tools uh, can talk to a mount point within, without any problem. And then, kind of most recently, we've been working with Fujifilm to add glacier compatibility or functionality to our S3 uh, uh, resource plugin. So, uh, IRADs can can read and write to you know a bucket somewhere on premise or up in the cloud. And so, some of these uh, platforms. Uh, are now providing uh, this glacier. They're they're doing their own policy management on the back for, you know, low access, long term storage, and so that um, the glacier API has been something that's been added to S3 in the last few years, and so now our our plugin can speak and understand uh, glacier as well. So th those semantics are now incorporated into the S3 plugin. I think this is the last one. So the Globus connector is uh, it used to be. So Globus has made a, a pivot in the last uh, few years. They also were uh, a sustainability model, all in open source out of the University of Chicago and uh, market forces <laughs> have made it so that they determined they needed to uh, centralize their authentication and, and charge for um, access to the product, uh, not, not per gigabyte necessarily of transfer, but actually just access itself. So. Uh, the model is a little different. They now have their own plugins called connectors. And so we took the open source code that was already out there for IRODs and 
turned it into a connector. So uh, the relationship with Globus now is that if someone is using this and paying for it, um, then we've got uh, access to them as well and a little bit of uh, you know uh, profit sharing, kind of a pass through, which is nice. So all this to say is that um, you know requiring proper data management does require policy. Uh, in the end, it's going to be people making decisions about <laughs> what can and should not happen. And those policies will change over time, which is another realization that I think a lot of organizations, they show up here and they make a decision, they expect it to just work, which is great until four years later and their leadership changes. Um, and then obviously the best way to do this is uh, open source. We think that's the best way to do this for, for a very long time. And I think that is time. Thank you. Happy hey, to take any questions you. and I'll be obviously in Gather Town as well later. Hey, thank you, Gerald. Um, yeah. Any questions? See if I can. Well, thanks for the talk, anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, Cuba. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to Ralph for waking up very early <laughs> to participate. <laughs> I don't know no which problem. time zone you are. You're East Coast or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm East Coast, yeah, it's, uh, it's now six in the morning, yes. Okay, okay, I really appreciate it and your contribution to the community as well. Uh, uh, what I found very interesting is one of those integrations you have with NFS. Yeah. Um, because in a way, if I understand correctly, in a way it is similar to the sync client that we have on the, on the, on the, on the user devices. So essentially you, you use your local file system as an interface to to the distributed system that's correct uh, so we just throw files in there and then some 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 system takes care of shipping them around that's right that's mm -hmm. right so none of the metadata that we have access to uh is visible obviously through the nfs client nfs doesn't know about that um but yeah we are basically providing a posix uh, interface into a distributed system yeah yeah, so that's a that's 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 a powerful. I think that's a very powerful metaphor, because um, um, you know in the in the science mesh uh, there is some work on also on uh, data transfers, um, and um, on this kind of metaphor, I think it could also be interesting for for, for people working on that. That's right, um, and and it would be interesting, I think, probably to try and plug these two things together and see if if any of the semantics are off a little bit because you know the standard is supposed to be a thing that we can all agree on but as we've seen with our s3 work um you know every company that provides an s3 compatible layer is not quite compatible <laughs> s3 is a lie yes <laughs> in the, we, we have uh we have found bugs in many companies appliances uh by running our <laughs> test suite Mm -hmm. And then, then my question is that um, uh, so you have some actors in the CS3 community that are your users. I think Surf is one, right? That's correct. Um, a number of yes. Let's see. We go look at all these slides. Yes, and these are only the ones that are that you know are members and and have their logo here. So yes. And uh, and how is. Uh, how is this used by, for example, at Surf? But maybe the so Surf before. Surf <laughs> provides uh, uh, storage and and networking, obviously, to to multiple organizations and um, uh, some of their they've got federated uh, instances of their tape archive and their long term storage uh, provided to multiple universities through through this uh, interface as well, and so. Um, in the same way that, that EU DAT does some of the same same work. Yeah, so they, they run centralized storage and, and, and archiving for multiple universities. Okay, so essentially universities would, they use this as a distribution mechanism for essentially for the, for the universities to archive their data. So that is, that is one use case. System at the end somewhere. That's, That's correct. correct. That's correct. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, one final question, Dan. Yeah, thanks. I had a question about the work that you did with uh, Fujifilm. It was yes. Fujifilm or Fuji 2. I don't, uh, I think it's the same, but they, this was, is this testing like an appliance that they have, which is compatible with Glacier or were, or was this to work with proper Glacier proper? 
uh, both, uh, but we were incentivized to spend the time on it because they showed up and said they wanted to give us money. So, uh, yes, so Fujifilm provides uh, a an appliance uh, that that they that is built on their tape technology. So, you know, all these different vendors are kind of leaking into each other's channels. So uh, the block storage people are adding some flash and then the tape people are adding some some uh, some some block in the middle. And so. Uh, yeah, uh, Fujifilm has added a, a caching layer in front and they're presenting as S3 uh, to that appliance. And so you get a, a fast response for things that are hot, but the, their internal mechanisms and policies to get it over to their tape interface, which, you know, that's where they make their, their real money. And that's where they, you know, they service uh, arts and enter uh, entertainment and media for, you know, films yeah. and Hollywood, that kind of stuff, music. And so, yes, they've provided uh, a glacier semantic to get to their tape. And so they were making sure that we that they were consistent. And then obviously we already tested against S3 proper as well. So they are now is there, uh, officially is there as open, good as what the Amazon's providing. Is there a thing open source? I ask because something like three years ago, there were discussions between them and the Ceph and Ceph upstream to yep. start a project to make Ceph S3 to use Ceph S3, Ceph's Rados Gateway, also as like their, a tape as their guy. protocol. Yeah. Are they I don't using know. that or do they do something else? Do you know? I don't know what they've done on their side of the wall. Um, yeah. They may be using Ceph. Uh, I would not be surprised, but it's I don't not, it's know. certainly not public. It's like it would be. No, no, no. It's not public. It, it is their product. Um, yeah. Uh, but the protocol, and, and we did, we found a couple of corner cases uh, where they, you know, they fixed it up pretty quick. So they were responsive. They, they wanted to sell, this is a new product for them. So uh, yeah, maybe okay. those are the same conversation that we were both having. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Very good.